Much as an inch is a unit that describes a length, and a knot is a unit that describes the rate of speed, there is a unit that describes how fast evolution happens. Let's call that unit a Darwin. It describes how fast some aspects or characteristics of an organism changes. One Darwin is a factor of 2.7 every million years. This factor is often used to evaluate whether there has been enough time since the beginning of life on Earth for the evolution of all the species who have ever lived. The average rate observed in the fossil record is 0.6 Darwins. And the fastest rate in the fossil record is 32 Darwins. So any rates faster than this in observations of evolution would ensure that there has been enough time. And the average rate of evolution observed in historical colonization events in the wild is 370 Darwins over 10 times the required minimum rate. In fact, the fastest rate found in colonization events was 80,000 Darwins, or 2,500 times the required rate. Observed rates of evolution in lab experiments are even more impressive, averaging 60,000 Darwins, and as high as 200,000 Darwins, or over 6,000 times the required rate. A more recent paper evaluating the evolutionary rate in guppies in the wild found rates ranging from 4,000 to 45,000 Darwins. Note that a sustained rate of 400 Darwins is sufficient to transform a mouse into an elephant in just 10,000 years. One of the most extreme examples of rapid evolution was when the hominid cerebellum doubled in size within 100,000 years during the Pleistocene. But this rate was only seven Darwins. This rate converts to a minuscule 0.02% increase per generation at most. Watching a fetus develop reveals much about the ancestral history of that organism. A human embryo in its third week is a featureless disk of cells until a furrow appears and plows its way across the top layer of cells. This is the primitive streak. As the primitive streak then begins to shorten, it leaves a trail in the form of a tube of tissues. This is the notochord, a stiffening rod found in embryos of all chordates. In primitive vertebrates, it persists throughout life as the main axial support of the body. But in higher vertebrates, the spinal cord replaces it. But because our developmental heritage, the spinal cord cannot develop unless the nodal cord secretes the right chemical signals. The genome includes the information necessary for the embryo to develop properly. But the genome has a history it has been passed down through a chain of ancestors unbroken since the dawn of life and it still goes through the motions of creating many of those ancestors 300 million years ago our ancestors were creatures who laid their eggs in water these eggs were small and round and contained yolk sacs to sustain the embryo this is the first stage of a human embryo but we notice that our embryo goes through a stage where it takes the form of a flattened disk. We can thank our reptile ancestors for this stage. When reptiles started laying their eggs with new hard shells on land, the embryos had to be supplied with a larger yolk to feed them through a long period of incubation. In order to accommodate this larger yolk, the embryo itself became a flattened disk squeezed between the yolk and the hard shell. The human embryo no longer needs a yolk sac, but even after millions of years, each human embryo is rolled out to form a germinal disk, reptile fashion, before rolling up again. There are many more times in fetal development 
in which evolutionary history plays a role. Human embryos all have temporary pharyngeal pouches which echo the gill pouches of our ancient fish ancestors. These pouches eventually became the structures that evolved from the gill pouches of fish. Structures that include the eustachian tube, middle ear, tonsils, parathyroid, and thymus. And of course it is not just physical structures themselves, but also the genes which control the development. Many of these genes controlling the development of human embryo are exactly the same genes that control the development of other creatures. In fact, some genes, like the Hox gene, which regulate the location and shape of limbs and parts, are able to control the development of creatures as different as flies and mammals. If every living creature on Earth descended from one species that could perform life's basic functions, replication, metabolism, etc., then not only should we inherit those functional capabilities, but we should also inherit the structures used to perform these functions. So a testable prediction of the idea of common descent is that all life should have similar structures that execute life's basic processes. And they do. Down past the cellular level and down to the molecules that support life's processes. All life on Earth shares the same molecules that allow life to function. Regardless of species, the polynucleotides, like DNA and RNA, polypeptides, like proteins, and polysaccharides, like starches and glucose, are identical. DNA, RNA, and proteins all have the same chemical form in spite of the fact that there are dozens of possibilities that would work. All life uses the same four molecules, adenine, cytosine, thymine, guanine, and the DNA ladder, although there are more than a hundred that could be used. All life bases its replication on the duplication of the DNA molecule. The proteins found in all life on Earth use the same 20 amino acids in their makeup while there are almost 400 that could have been used. All life on Earth shares the same universal genetic code built into its DNA. The letters on the DNA ladder, taken three at a time, form coded instructions as to which amino acids should be joined together to form a protein. Every species on Earth uses the identical code to perform this function. Bacteria uses exactly the same code for making proteins that humans do. All life on Earth shares the same metabolic pathways. In all life, based on cells with a nucleus, from amoebas to blue whales, glucose is metabolized in the same 10 steps, in the same order, using the same 10 enzymes. Thousands of new species are discovered yearly and have their DNA proteins sequenced examined. Nearly 50 million new bases are sequenced every day and everyone is tested of the theory of common descent. It passes every test. There are enough different possible genetic codes, all functionally equivalent and all using the same amino acids, for every species that has ever lived to have its own unique code. If there were no common ancestor from whom all life inherited this code, it would make sense to expect a wide variety of codes. This would protect each species from interspecies viral infections. The lack of variety indicates common origin. 